communicate as much as possible together. So let me just talk about the two. We've got a lot of major issues. I mean, I, I hate to overstate it, but it's true. Um, but let me, let's talk about the shutdown for one second. So as you know, we're in the 27th day of the shutdown. And so while all the dysfunction in, in uh, D.C. is happening, we in Hamilton County are, are suffering the impacts. There are, there are really three major impacts. One is with the SNAP program. The SNAP dollars come from the federal government and run through Hamilton County for 100,000 people in Hamilton <coughs> County. Which is huge. I, I was astounded by that number. Maybe I shouldn't be. But anyway, I was. And so well, here's what's happening. The SNAP benefits have been front-loaded onto the cards of the recipients as of yesterday. But they have to go through February and into March on their date when they generally get benefits in March, not February. Because they get these uh, monthly you know, payments to these cards, and that's how it goes, and that's what they budget for, and that's what people understand the program to do. That is not happening. So the cards have been front-loaded with enough money to cover the rest of this month, all of February, till the date they receive the next benefit in March. That's a long period of time, and if you're not paying a lot of attention as the recipient of those benefits, my fear is that you spend what you've got and by come, come end of February, you're out and you don't completely understand what happened, but what you do know is you don't have any money left to feed your family. That's a real impact. Mm -hmm. And so Moira Weir, who I know has been here before, um, is doing her very best to make sure that the recipients of SNAP benefits understand this. Uh, I was on the radio with Lincoln Ware this morning, I did LW yesterday, you know, so we're trying to get the word out, but I can tell you something, and, and we're also anticipating a resolution by March. Now, if that doesn't happen, all bets are off, and I have no idea what that looks like. Uh, but assuming it does happen, we may be turning to the nonprofit community, the private sector, to say we need an, uh, an, you know, an influx of support for the free store food bank and other agencies that help with food insecurity. So I just want to put that out there because that's happening real time, like now. Uh, the other thing that the county is dealing with outside of some of the issues that are relative to the city is our budget. And you all know this, and I've been here before talking about this. Um, we still have that deficit that I talked about last time. Uh, $28 million deficit. We have done our best to plug that hole in this current budget. Uh, some one-time money, some restricted funding, uh, some reduction in, in force uh, over in you know, the courts, at the jail. Uh, yeah, again, JFS and the work they do is impacted. All, the, all of this is impacted. We've got a hiring freeze on. Uh, we're not doing as much economic development work. We pulled back on some of that. It's so frustrating because that's not why I ran for this position. I ran to move the county forward and we are stuck. Uh, and so you are going to hear probably about the sales tax increase again. I do not know when. I don't know what the iteration of that will be. But we have a study being conducted right now to find out where the efficiencies lie in county government. And I'm sure we will find some. Uh, but also, how can we address the, the lack of revenue that we have coming in right now just for general purposes for the work that we do. Uh, so that is something we are going to have to tackle in 2019. Unfortunately, it is not the best place for somebody in elected office to be. Uh, last thing I want to do is say, oh, let's raise taxes. Yeah. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we're in a pretty bad spot, the, primarily because of the state cuts that have come down to the county and the city. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, well, the, will Governor DeWine and the current General Assembly be any help? I, I know Cordray would have been, because I talked to him, right? We all talked to Cordray and said, Rich, okay, here's the thing. And, and Rich Cordray knew exactly what was going on, and he said, I will help you on that front with that local government funds. DeWine has been a little more evasive, uh, but the county commissioners have talked to him, the mayors have talked to him, so it's on the radar. He does have to have a legislature that's willing to go along, uh, and I am not sure we're there, uh, but I am... I'm not really optimistic. I'm hopeful that we will make some progress there because, boy, if we could get just some of that back, that would be such a relief on, on what we're doing as a county. So that's kind of my doom and gloom overview, as I always do. Wow. So I have a long list of issues that yeah. we need three hours to deal with, <laughs> um, and I know we're not going to do that. And, of course, it, it does start sounding doom and gloom. And I was going to close, and I'm going to start the way I was going to close. I really love the opportunity to be a member of Cincinnati City Council. Uh, there's some exciting things going on. We should be very 
proud and happy about the renaissance that uh, not just OTR, but so many neighborhoods are experiencing. And in, in the, in, in, as the, at the same time, we need to move to making sure that all of our citizens benefit from uh, that wonderful growth, that wonderful sense of progress, that we address poverty rates, we have address uh, the lack of affordable housing, and so forth. So that's where we talk about the doom and gloom because we have to do those things. So just very quickly, the first thing I was going to talk about was Cincinnati's budget. Are, are you on a, a fiscal year also or a calendar? So we've shifted to a, to a fiscal year uh, and pretty soon we'll be addressing the 2020 fiscal year which starts uh, July 1. Uh, the, uh, we, we had some figures given to us a few weeks ago and the projected deficit at this point, that is the gap between revenues and uh, continue what we do, is only $18.8 million. So, you know, it's been great shape. <laughs> Except that in recent years, we've done about all there is to do uh, in terms of uh, not filling positions, uh, increasing fees and uh, licenses and the like. Uh, and we've run out of uh, the High Wire Act possibilities. If we continue, as we probably will, to hold police and fire harmless, representing about two-thirds of our budget, uh, just tentatively as we talk about balancing the budget, other departments are being asked to prepare a budget that reduces their expenditure by 14%. <coughs> and that can be huge if you look at uh, things that those departments do, the health department, recreation department, parks department, snow removal, trash removal, support of uh, human services. So we, we've got a big job. I don't know why on earth I asked to be chair of budget and finance committee at this particular time. It was a terrible time. But uh, we will get there one way or another. And of course, people say, well, how come it's so bad? Well, the local government fund, if it had been continuing, uh, continued where it was when Kasich took office, that would be $27 million more dollars a year. So that explains a lot of it. Uh, Curiously and uncharacteristically, based on what we assume in this community, some of our larger corporations are not producing the income payments that we expect. And we have a phenomenon we have had for the last 18 months or so. The monthly collections from uh, salary uh, and the 2.1% that uh, workers pay, uh, those collections go up at the same time the collections from the business tax and that income tax has not grown nearly uh, to the extent that we expected it. And although we're not allowed to see individual uh, tax returns of businesses, it's the bigger companies in town that uh, have resulted in that shortfall, which is creating a continuing problem. There's one more thing that we have to think about going forward in this community. Uh, our tax uh, rate is 2.1%. That includes 0.3 that's dedicated to the transit system. So our effective tax rate for municipal purposes of apart from transportation is 1.8 and today in the state of Ohio Columbus Dayton Toledo and Cleveland have a tax rate of 2.5 percent and they don't uh, that doesn't include any allocation for transit uh, their transit uh, systems are supported in different ways I don't know the details but that's one of the reasons so it's interesting, uh, yesterday the Better Bus Coalition, and we probably won't talk about transportation a little bit, <coughs> indicated they're gonna put a, a, a would like to put a, a charter amendment on the ballot that would increase uh, the earnings tax uh, to 2.3, would add another 0.2 for transportation, which would go, go from 0.3 to 0.5, and <coughs> do nothing for the, nothing for the city's uh, budget, and, frankly, would continue the, uh, what I think is the unfairness of the city taxpayers uh, carrying the water completely for the transportation system. So anyway, those are my opening remarks. I'm glad to be here. And I'll comment real quickly on transportation because I have always advocated for a hybrid system where the county sales tax pays for part of the transit system and part of the city um, earnings tax pays for it. It's kind of a shared you know, pay, pay system because you are correct when you look at sales tax, which is where I live, um, we are also far lower than other counties, especially of our size, but really most other counties, because 0.5 of our sales tax goes to general purposes, but 0.5 goes to stadiums. 
and 0.25 goes to Union Terminal. So 0.75 of the sales tax is going to something other than basic county services. That puts us in a bit of a bind, uh, and, and the transit tax then in other communities is on top of that. And so many of them do have about a 0.25 or a 0.5 increase then on the sales tax. We don't have any. And so I have said maybe we should look at a 0.25 or a 0.5 sales tax increase to support public transit and maybe some infrastructure and have the city in a position where they can maybe reduce, not eliminate the earnings tax that goes to transit, but maybe reduce that uh, to incentivize business. So I'm, I think we're both open to that conversation. You hear a lot about this. That is true, but behind the scenes, I think we are trying to appreciate each other's position on this and move public transit forward uh, to the ballot in a way that we can win on the ballot, uh, <coughs> which is my, frankly, biggest concern is that we put something up and it fails, and then we're set back for about 10 years. So and transportation is obviously a major problem. So it, it, if you seek to fund the reasons for uh, high unemployment rates in our community, high poverty rates, uh, a lot of it is the fact that where people live who need jobs doesn't, uh, they, they're not, the transportation system doesn't make, make it easy for them to get to where the jobs are. And we're talking about entry level jobs where if the alternative, is uh, an old automobile, uh, you, that means that the job and job security depends on that old automobile not having a major problem, not to mention the other things that uh, send people back into unemployment, health, health issues, and the like. So that's one of the major issues our community has to work through, and it's definitely important for a lot of reasons. Um, 